Okay, so our keynote uh, presenter today, now that the train permitted, <laughs> no, it's, is... it, it's the taxi permitted. Oh, yeah, yeah the, the driver taxi. was driving like Fernando Alonso. So oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was so, grabbing on. <laughs> so is uh, Peter Sommerlad. Uh, I know Peter now. Probably f for Probably 15 years 15 or so. Years, something. Uh, yeah, something like, something like that. So that that is a good thing of being in the committee. You really meet very well known, um, highly professional uh, people, and you learn a lot uh, from them. Uh, I have to say, I have learned a lot uh, from Peter. We have had uh, joint so. projects, and we have enjoyed a lot about uh, around C++. So thank you very much, Peter, uh, for coming, and for giving us a second uh, uh, shot on Misra C++. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. And that's how far my Spanish goes. Uh, <laughs> Um, I have the uh, QR code on my GitHub. I usually keep all my talks, uh, the PDFs, and this is not just the slides, but also some handout notes, especially when there are links on that. It's easier to with the handouts to actually uh, follow them. Uh, so I strongly recommend you. I will show the QR code at the end as well. So, and, and I guess I still have an hour? Yeah. Okay, then, then I'm, I'm good, yeah. Um, otherwise, I'll speed up a little bit. Uh, if you have any further questions, I'm eager to code review, so don't be shy to reach out to me. I'm on that uh, uh, Mastodon uh, social uh, me media thing where I'm addicted to after quitting uh, what was uh, called Twitter. And nevertheless, I'm also here uh, to be hired, so that's kind of a marketing thing and some of you actually paid for me to see me on Tuesday and I will have the same, uh, one of the same quizzes I did on Tuesday so please hold your horses then because you know the answers already. So. <laughs> now Misra C++. Um, Richard, oops, sorry, so shouldn't walk around. Richard actually uh, showed you yesterday some example uh, guidelines, which I appreciate. And uh, the thing is, in 2008, MISRA C++ uh, was targeting not only C++ 98 or C++ 03, but also was targeting, let's say, not so good C programmers programming in C++, which is what I found not really appreciable when I first looked at Misra C++, uh, the 2008 version. I found them actually miserable. I shouldn't say that, but I'm, I'm still doing that, 2008. Uh, reasons multi manifold, but I, I put up my head and said, no, I want to make safety guidelines in a way that modern C++ can actually be written and they more or less fostering modern C++. That's why I joined first Autosar for completely free, no money, no, nothing involved, just enthusiasm to get the Autosar guidelines a little bit more C++-y. Uh, unfortunately, most of the guidelines were uh, written by Java programmers, the Autosar guidelines. And <laughs> if you know that, you see it in some of the Autosar guidelines. Also, Autosar was addressing a very specific software environment given by the Autosar adaptive uh, environment, so a little bit of history. Anybody working in automotive? Uh, only a few, okay. Um, so you might have heard what Autosar is. If you haven't, just forget what I said. Um, then came Misra, Autosar threw over the wall every, uh, all their rules to, to Misra uh, to continue working on them and give an official Misra guideline and uh, the results are available since around November. Now, where is safety relevant? <coughs> all kind of things where human life is at harm. Medical devices, any medical device people here? A uh, few, yeah. Uh, any kind of transportation system, trains, pl airplanes, which I didn't have a logo on there, uh, uh, traffic control, cars, self-driving cars. Oh, 
Okay. I still doubt that level five is ever achievable unless you put them on a track and that's called a train. Um, nevertheless, what makes code unsafe? The biggest thing in C++ is undefined behavior. And I'm sure everybody of you has written a piece of code in their life, has created some code that had undefined behavior. The problem with undefined behavior, it might still work. Like we've seen yesterday, Nico claiming, oh, that's code. Yeah, that works. No, it doesn't. Undefined behavior can mean anything can happen. <laughs> Unicorns jumping out of the blue or uh, uh, whatever. Undefined behavior you want to avoid. But there are other things like implementation-defined behavior. And things like int, for example, you never know how many bits an int have because that's implementation defined. The compiler is required to tell you that, but if you want to port code or have portable code, uh, your assumptions about things that are implementation defined might just be wrong on the uh, new target device that you're addressing. I've ported code from 16-bit to 32-bit. I've written code on 32-bit machines that had the assumption, okay, a, a pointer and a long and an int are all 32 bits which is great until you, they, are not, they aren't anymore requiring porting. Then there's unspecified behavior, which is kind of a, a situation where the standard knows what tells the compilers what to actually achieve or the library implementers, but doesn't tell them the details on how to achieve them or is, gives leeway on implementation uh, freedom but at least you know what, what comes up. But there might be side effects or subtleties in the behavior where the unspecified behavior uh, might differ from one system to the other. And all these areas risk in the safety uh, environment that the code is misbehaving. Now, what makes code unsafe? Especially the old Mr. C++ guidelines assumed imperfect programmers and try to address also misunderstandings. Like, uh, what if an identifier is spelled with an uh, I or a lowercase l or a capital I? It might be har very hard to see the difference in, 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 in a printout. Well, we have IDEs, I hope, for all of you, where identifier names actually are easily to navigate. You hover with your mouse over an identifier and you see the definition. So that, that misunderstanding of cause of different spelling is no longer there. And it's also very hard to phrase a rule and write a checker for a rule that is reasonably uh, working for, let's say, possibly misunderstandable variable or type names. There are other misunderstandings and I'm sure everybody in this room had their misunderstanding of C++ including me. I have many misunderstandings of C++. The good thing is I have people to ask for, like the core mailing list, um, where is it written down what the behavior should be? And just this morning I triggered a, a situation where, well, maybe we should rephrase this section in the standard. So even the standard is not written in all places in a way that is completely unambiguous or easy. At least it's never written in a way that's easy to understand. So don't try to learn C++ from the sender. It's, I would say it's impossible. I know people who've tried that, uh, but that requires really big brains and very big enthusiasm. Now, one important thing, we had Phil yesterday and I cannot stress it enough. Having good unit tests, that's what I call guts, or what actually Kevin Henney, another friend of mine, calls guts. Having good unit tests is not part of the Misra C++ standard, but if you look into the ISO 61508, which is a safety standard for software and electronics control systems, or the ISO 262, which is a similar, actually more or less the copy paste of 61508 for automotive with some extra things about automotive. If you look there, there's an overarching rule, have well, educated personnel when doing a safety critical system, use the state of the art, and invest in continuing education. So if you ever go into the 
area where you write safety critical code, these are prerequisites. If your bosses don't pay you for a training course or further education, tell them they are violating the safety guideline, uh, the safety standards uh, published by ISO. Now, unit testing. I do unit testing for C++ for more than 25 years. Not only for my own code, I was also teaching unit testing for at least 20 years now. And that's a prerequisite. My graduates would fail if they wouldn't do proper test automation in their project work. So be aware, it's teachable, it's learnable, it requires some learning curve, like everything you think. If you don't know how to swim and jump into the ocean, yeah, it might be hard to keep afloat. It requires practice uh, and no, not everybody would be a, a a world record swimmer, but unit testing is much easier than swimming because after you practice it a little bit and it gives you that feedback cycle, especially the, the brain cycle that uh, what, what Phil was explaining yesterday. It's so cool when your tests run. It's just, you feel so good. I would never write a piece of code except maybe in the Godbolt Compiler Explorer, but I wouldn't write a test case for it first. And maybe I forgot test cases, or I might write some test cases afterwards. That's also okay. So have unit tests. If you don't know how to unit test, go to Phil or ask me. We are able to explain that. Now, that aside, how do we get into unsafe code? Well, there are a few things. It's not only the language unsafety, undefined behavior, but also your system needs to actually operate in a way how it's specified. So it must do what it's required to do, even if the requirement isn't spelled out. And this wrong behavior thing is the big part of the bad things. The language parts where people say, oh, we want to save language because that brings us safety. No, it doesn't bring you safety. It reduces risk in a the, in the small area. But the, the other risk about misunderstanding of the requirements or uh, forgetting to care for corner cases or whatever, just doing the wrong thing, that's also a safety issue. And no language will solve that for you. Now, that unsafe behavior can be immediate. You can write code that is always wrong. That's easy. So be aware of that. Uh, if it's about language, things that are always wrong, those usually are also easy to detect. So maybe the compiler will already warn you. If you're lucky, it might not even compile. But there are other things that are lurking and data dependent. So we're actually, depending on what data you get from the user, from the environment, from a sensor, or what you operate on, you might end up that code is okay in most of the, most of the times, but sometimes, it, is, it has undefined behavior. Now, what to do about that? And there's also code evolution, code changes. Either the platform changes, and one thing to remember, reasonably working software, not those that is completely broken, is used much longer than you ever thought of. I've made systems that were intended to run two or three years that became old enough to vote or I think even old enough to drink in the US, written in C++. It's happening, not only in the retro gaming or computer scene, but also in real life. My doctor still has a um, um, ultrasonic uh, uh, scanner that runs on Windows, I think 95 or 98. Just be aware of that. Evolution, porting stuff is also evolution. Again, the different um, integers, we have other issues where there's implementation defined behavior and DNS, for example, that makes can make porting quite uh, atricious. Now, what is MISRA? It used to stand for Motor Industry Software Reliability Association. It's no longer standing for that. I have no idea why. Uh, someone, maybe Richard, uh, I'm not sure if he's still here, uh, uh, might be able to tell you about that. Um, 
What's in the safety norms? They ask for, let's say, all means that it's possible to make your code safer. And one means is to have static analysis. Now, to have a static analysis tool, you need to have a rule set that they check for. And that is where Misra jumped in and, and, and started writing on, on working on Misra C++, which is uh, Misra C, and later on C++ because they, they figured, okay, maybe the controllers also require uh, 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 C++ code because the complexity of the systems. Autos are adaptive, came around with their C++ guidelines because self-driving cars are really uh, complicated things that you don't want to actually implement just in C. And with that in the background, if you compare, for example, the MISRA C++ guidelines and the C++ core guidelines, the MISRA guidelines are more focused on having rules that are analyzable with a static analyzer. One reason is, first, the people, uh, many people working on the rules were from companies selling static analyzers, like Richard yesterday. So that's more or less, they are volunt voluntary working on the rules so that they can sell products. I was just voluntary working on the rules, so I, I don't sell anything, maybe except trainings. Now, what are typical MISRA misconceptions? I've seen people, oh, now we got a MISRA checker, we run it, and we got 10,475 violations. What should we do about that? That's an issue, but the issue is not that they get these violations, now, the issue is they didn't get the static analyzer when they wrote their first line of code. And uh, if you have code with these many rule violations, first thing to remember, MISRA rules are meant to be violated, actually, but with reason. So that's one of the things. Other situation, oh, our code is 100% MISRA compliant, whatever that means. And therefore, it's safe. No, you still have wrong behavior, possibly, in your code that doesn't do what it's intended to do. And that's the same issue as just the code crashing. Now, MISRA forbids me to uh, write required code. That's something I had in my head when I first saw the MISRA C++ 2008 guidelines. And that, I hope, is coming, becoming better. But there are still things there where deliberately things are forbidden but in a way that you actually can use them, but you have a good have to actually justify the use of the thing. There are, I would say, most of the rules that aren't uh, that are uh, kind of are written in a way where we know that you have to deviate from them to get your system working. But you should deviate from them in a tiny area and encapsulate the deviation so that the deviation records are manageable. You don't want to write deviation records for 10,000 uh, uh, rule violations. And then there are other things like, oh, the standard library violates MISRA, so we have to implement our own MISRA-compliant standard, li uh, standard library replacement. Don't. If your vendor ships a compiler, the standard library is at least assumed to be correct or safe. In addition, you can actually uh, qualify that the standard library implementation um, is working according to a specification, and that specification is called the uh, ISO C++ standard. And there are actually companies doing that for you, or even vendors selling their libraries. We are certified by some uh, certification authority that we are conforming to the uh, uh, ISO C++ standard, which is much more than you would ever get with your own library implementations. And the last thing, MISRA rules are redundant and confusing. I try to explain a little bit why that is the case, and it, you might still get that impression. Now, how to get MISRA compliance? Actually, that's a QR code that links you to the document on how to achieve MISRA compliance, regardless of the specific MISRA rules. It tells you about the difference between rules and directives. A rule is something a static analyzer will try to check. And a directive is something that is an uncheckable but still a good thing to do. So, for example, it's not in there, but my directive would be have good unit tests. There are other directives that say, okay, uh, I forgot what, what I wanted to say, sorry. <laughs> My 
my speaker notes seem to be out of sync, so no, no, don't, no problem. Uh, now, there are also different levels of rules. There are mandatory rules that you must not go away. Usually those are already either code that will might even not compile, but there might be bad compilers that still give you the leeway to compile. The, the MISRA C++ 2008 had some, some of those rules that were, well, that's not valid C++, but okay, maybe there were at the time bad compilers around that would accept that. And there are other rules that are required, and required rules are kind of, yes, please follow them, but you are allowed in individual cases to actually deviate from them with good reason. And some of the required rules are intentionally written as required rules so you, that you have to document the deviation properly, even though we know you need to deviate from them regardless what kind of software you're writing. So that's, you will never, you will be 100% MISRA compliant, but still have deviations of the MISRA rules. And those just must be documented. The advisory rules that are spelled with should are, give a little bit more leeway in the project, you can actually upgrade advisory rules to become uh, required rules, but also you can say, no, this advisory rule doesn't fit on our environment. We just generally ignore it, and you have just a document that you ignore that advisory rule. Uh, let's say you have one deviation for the whole project, whereas with the required rules, you have to deviate individually whenever you have to uh, make that deviation. Now, why do we have MISRA C++ and MISRA C exist? C and C++ share a lot of, share many vulnerabilities. C++ introduced a few more. And things like pointer arithmetic are available in both languages. The fortunate thing in C++, you can get write code that doesn't do pointer arithmetic directly. In C, it's almost impossible whenever you, you the only means is you have arrays and pointers and there's no things like an iterator concept that's all not expressible directly in the language that you would be able to do in C++. And even if there, it's the same mechanism that you're using, you might end up with much better mitigations in C++ than you would be able to do in C. And I might show you some of them. Even if you don't use MISRA C++, there are some generic resilience mechanisms Turn on compiler warnings, make them errors, make your code strictly C++, ISO C++ conforming by making, uh, my, uh, using minus pedantic errors, or use the similar, uh, uh, let's say, options for your Microsoft compiler if you're using that. And also appreciate the C++ type system. I summarized that on Tuesday, every cast that you need to write or think you need to write gives you feedback that you actually have a problem in your type design of your program. One of the most important things where C++ distinguishes itself from most other languages is the deterministic object lifetime and the closing curly brace. Can I point that? Yeah, this one. That's actually the killer feature of C++ in the sense of the word. It kills all objects in local scope and the destructors allow you to have clean up code. And that is deterministic object lifetime and lifetime management gives a lot of power, but also a lot of responsibility as well, because you might still have an access path to an object that is just dead. That is something to take watch out for. In addition to the static analysis by the compiler, you might employ other static analyzers and I recommend to get more than one and use the option to have sanitizers as well that do runtime analysis of your code base, like address sanitizer or undefined behavior sanitizer. You might not want to run the sanitizer in your production code on your device or in your car, but at least during testing, it's important to figure out that you have, don't have the obvious bugs that you might have made. And again, avoid the bad stuff. If you cannot avoid it, encapsulate it tightly, like Vector is still doing pointer arithmetic under the hood, but you wouldn't use it directly. Now, some example rules, we actually seen some of them in the, uh, in the quiz yesterday. A function shall not contain unreachable statements and variables should be at least used at least once. 
And there are more like that. And you see, I marked the shell and the should. So should is something, yeah, I can get around with that easily. And with shell, I have to think really hard and have a good reason and maybe sign it in triplicate and blood to actually deviate from it. Um, unreachable statements is something you could say, well, the compiler is very good at figuring out unreachable statements and will optimize away the code anyway. On the other hand, mis uh, safety critical code is also meant to be reviewed by humans, not just the static analyzers, because humans might actually be able to find those wrong behaviors that are because the requirements aren't fulfilled. And uh, the less code a human has to grasp, the easier it is to get around the situation that we have the um, uh, are able to actually understand what, what we are trying to achieve or achieving what we are trying to achieve. And uh, things like, okay, pointer arithmetic shall not form an invalid pointer. You might even say, oh, it must not form an invalid pointer. The point is, if the point is never dereferenced, forming it is still okay-ish if you're ne never using it, but accidentally using a, a, an invalid pointer is undefined behavior. Now, I had that redundant rules. That was one of the, my first impressions with mis being in contact with Misra C++ 2008 without any outside explanation. I figured out, well, why is this rule in there? Because if you follow that other rule, it never happens. I didn't understand or know then that you can actually deviate from a rule. So many rules are written in a way that are kind of, there's a second or even third level safeguard behind them. So if you look at 681, an object shall not be accessed outside of its lifetime. Actually that should read must, but there's no means to actually prove that with a static analysis tool. Therefore it, it's, uh, it's not spelled at must. But on the other hand, there are a few cases where it's obvious it's undefined behavior regardless, even though it might not uh, be problematic if it's never used. For example, a function must not return the address or a point, uh, the reference or a pointer to, the, to a local variable, which is kind of obvious to detect. Compilers will warn you about in many cases, maybe not all, but hopefully all static analyzers uh, that are MISRA compliance will check 6082 completely which is something that's a no-go because whenever you can use the, the return value, the actual object it refers to is already gone because it, you passed the curly brace or returned from a function. So whenever you, so this is kind of the safeguard. The first rule is uncheckable in general, but the second rule is concretely checkable. Therefore we have these two kind of redundant rules. So it's kind of 682 is, part of 681, but it's not there. The second thing is this second level of, of uh, uh, protection. A cast should not convert a pointer to an inter integral type. If anybody is doing things like uh, storing stuff on external storage and keeping pointers there that still are valid afterwards, yes, you might want to do so which is a rare case, but you need to encapsulate. So you might actually want to deviate from 827, even if it's just for logging the addresses somewhere so that you can actually see them later on. But then you, if you do so, you better not cast your pointer to a short. There are types in the standard library that guarantee that a round trip casting to an integer to that integer type and back to a pointer keeps the pointer value intact. It still will point to the same object. Hopefully it still exists, but that's, uh, so if you violate 872, uh, 827, there's still the safeguard 828 in there that tells you do it in a reasonably reasonable way and not in an unreasonable way. Another thing um, that's uh, actually Nico's, uh, how do you say, it, the main example to get that got fixed in C23, but Misra C was addressing C17. And that took us quite a time to come up with the formulation that was checkable and understandable and didn't use 
uh, appropriate in its uh, title. We learned about appropriate yesterday already. So the range four initializer can actually iterate over a dangling range using dangling iterators. And that's not good because it's undefined behavior. And uh, the, I don't, Want to explain all the things? Uh, Nico can do that better. It's just we came up with the situation. Okay, what ha what's ha to make that happen? That you have a temporary created in the range for initializer, and then access parts of the temporary and iterate it over those requires you to have at least two function calls, either constructor plus a member function or another function, or uh, one function returning a, temp uh, a temporary and then another one. Uh, digging into that, like that example with the make function returning a vector of string, then you iterate over the first string in that vector. That vector is returned by value, which is actually how it should be done. The problem is the, the returned value is a temporary, and now you dig into the temporary and front uh, and at or front, yeah, that's at zero, will return a reference to that temporary object content and not give any lifetime extension. Uh, if the vector specification would be different, like having an R value ref qualified overload for add that returns by value, this code would work, but it doesn't. Therefore, this is non-compliant. There are two function calls. It will be it will work in C plus plus twenty three on words, but uh, that's because the language rules were bent to make it work. Now, I had in my text the appreciation of the type system. What is a type system? When I was a young programmer, I was hating Pascal's type system because it didn't allow me to use integers and real numbers together in an expression. I needed to convert them if possible, or at least I got uh, errors by the compiler that I hated because in basic it would just work. And if you look back, what are types around the Algol times, people became aware, okay, we can do something about type system. There's even type system theory. I only learned to appreciate the types type systems much more than before when I worked with a colleague that was working on formal methods and he introduced me to actually type system theory, not just what's in the compiler by happenstance. Now, if you look at assembly language, the, you can do with whatever is in your register in, or in your memory, and only the program code actually do, explains what, the, what, what they mean, if it's a number or a string. So if you store my first name Peter somewhere in memory and now take that address and treat it, uh, the, the memory location as an integer, you're free to do so in assembly language, just works. It does, just doesn't make sense. And then came Algol, and if you look at the precursor of C, it still didn't have much of a type system, it just had words. And you could take a word and use it either as a pointer or as an integer, it just would uh, generate the corresponding assembly language uh, regardless. So, but C was a big breakthrough, C had a type system. You could define your own types, structs, and maybe enums which are kind of inst in disguise in, in C. Um, but at least C gave us a type system. It had its weaknesses because it was written by the best programmers of the time for themselves, assuming everybody was the best programmer of their time using C. Unfortunately, then C got popular. And now with C++, Bjarne took the idea of having its own type system even further by providing a much better type system. Unfortunately, all the holes that C had in it for, let's say, convenience for implementation of the compiler and also for leeway of portability to different architectures uh, made it into C++ as well. And that's one of the curses of the language. And now there are languages like Haskell that take the type system and the ability what you can express with the type system even much further than C++. And people claim if your program compiles in Haskell, it's correct. 
requires still some superhero uh, brain to get the type system right for your problem domain. But nevertheless, that's a claim they make. I'm still finding bugs in, uh, in Haskell programs like Pandoc, uh, but things like that happen. Not enough test cases. Now, now ask those who attended Tuesday workshop to be silent. Just to show you the ugliness of C and C++ in the language, the built-in types. Who has ever used, never used int in their code? That's good. Who is using int? I hope almost everybody. Now, if you have two random integer numbers, int, x and y, now the guess is, what is the probability of undefined behavior of a given arithmetic expression? x divided by zero. Shout out. One. That's one. One hundred percent. That's just wrong code. Good. Now it's it a bit more tricky. X divided by Y. What's the probability of having undefined behavior? Or how many cases do you have to care for? One thing is Y is zero. That's the easy part. Most common checks. Who has checked that y is not zero in their code when doing division? Okay. But there's another case I'd like to point you out. It, huh? Minus one. If, why, why is minus one? Huh? Y being minus one. Y might be minus one and x might be int max. Uh, int min, sorry. Thank you. Int min divided by minus one. Well, he's on the standard committee, or she should, he should know. <laughs> Int min divided by minus one gives you a number that is not representable as a signed integer. Because if you do the bit fiddling that is done by, by it, it's kind of a negation, and you cannot negate the smallest representable integral number because that doesn't have a corresponding uh, representation as a positive number in the two's complement representation of integers. So you get integer overflow if you take int min divided by minus one, which is a sign change, and that's impossible So it's uh, to represent, so get integer overflow, and that's undefined behavior. Remember that. Anybody who had the check by to divide by minus uh, by zero, did you also check that y wouldn't be minus 1 and int uh, x not uh, int min? I did. You did? Yep. Oh, cool. Now, x plus y addition looks harmless. What's the percentage of undefined behavior with random numbers? Huh? 50% is a good guess. That's happening with uh, uh, unsigned numbers. With signed numbers, you might have signed compensation. So if you have a positive and a negative number, uh, uh, that, that's a good thing. It cannot overflow. Um, so x plus y, it's 25% uh, is, is undefined behavior. Now, x times y. Oh, okay. A lot. Uh, you might have seen the tweet by Sean Parent, but any guesses from the audience who is not on the C++ committee and wasn't uh, with me on Tuesday? Just shout out. It will be incorrect anyway, I guess. <laughs> a lot is, not go is, is good, so that's, but, but what is a lot in your mind? More than 50%? More than 75%? More than 90%? Some nods. More than 99%? Actually, it's seven nines. It's almost for sure. If you would play the lottery, that's a sure win. If you, <laughs> it's seven nines for signed integer multiplication. Um, I actually tried. For 16-bit, it's a little bit less if you have 16-bit integers uh, because you don't have that many numbers. But for 32-bit uh, integers, is, I think it's seven nines if I get it right from the top of my head. And this multiplication, if I would have an AI-based optimizer, 
any time I would see signed integer multiplication, I would just optimize away because it's undefined behavior. Seven nines, that's, that's a high probability of undefined behavior. Unless the compiler can actually prove that the numbers are in a range that's reasonable where it's no undefined behavior. And that is something uh, Sean Parent made me aware of that and he even missed your calculate because he used unsigned first. And I'm not sure if that seven or nine nines, but I think it's seven nines, but uh, regardless, it's really, really high probability. The good thing is most of the time you wouldn't have random numbers as input, but just consider you're writing a device where one of those numbers comes from an external sensor or from a user input or from the network. And that's a random input regardless because hardware can be wrong if it's a sensor. Uh, users and networks can be very malicious and multiplying such a number with some other number risks undefined behavior. Be aware of that. So built-in types are evil and they have a lot of undesirable behaviors. We have the under, uh, overflow uh, that is a problem with undefined behavior. We have unsigned that don't overflow but wrap around which is also a curse for some people because then oh we don't want undefined behaviors. We do all arithmetic in unsigned numbers but then you wouldn't figure out that the results are actually wrong because of the wraparound. And there's even more things, even when you work with unsigned integers, if they are shorts that have a, lot, a lower rank than int in the uh, integral promotion, they get promoted to signed integers. So you can have two innocent looking U in 16 T values. If you multiply them, you still can get undefined behavior because they get promoted to signed integers first and then the multiplication is signed integer and then you end up with uh, integer overflow risk. A little bit lower because you have, don't have the range of the full 32-bit 32 -bit numbers, but still it's a probability that you get overflow with unsigned shorts that you multiply. I created a library to work around that and I don't want to get into the details now. I just tell you it's there. I try to use enum class types as replacement types for integers and with operator overloading, they look like integers and I implemented those to actually uh, having a workaround to, not, to, to be able to not use the built-in integers and still do arithmetic that is kind of safe. Um, that's how you do that and that's how you can use them. And other types still have the problems like, oh, what about float? Uh, what about the implicit conversions that you get across these types? And uh, I've seen people using um, type alias like type if are using for double to represent their internal types like uh, voltage and resistance if it's about uh, electrics uh, stuff. And those built-in types, even standard string, don't carry any application specific semantics. The underlying design pattern is called whole value pattern written by Ward Cunningham, who is actually the inventor of Wikiweb, not Wikipedia, but the precursor of having collaborative editing abilities. Um, and he wrote that uh, pattern around 95-ish, maybe a little bit earlier when the pattern movement started out. And the problem is the meaning of a string in your application is rarely just a sequence of characters. It ha might have a meaning of a name, of a URL, like yesterday in Hana's talk, of anything like that. So it carries application specific semantics and you better express those semantic categories as your own types. Even if it's just wrapping an int or a string, make them your own types. The standard types are building blocks for you to make your own types to actually employ the strong C++ type system to avoid implicit <coughs> conversions, to employ, let's say, undesirable operations by making your own types for your application. That is an art that is underappreciated very often when teaching programming. It was underappreciated in my education, even though I suffered from it. I didn't figure it that it's underappreciated. If you want to learn more about the whole value pattern, come to my trainings or whatever. There are 
a lot of things, and we've seen some of those again yesterday in, in, in the quiz. I don't want to go over the details. You can read about that in the uh, slides when you, when you get them or in the Misra standard. It's just Misra tries hard to not get you into the traps of having uh, undesirable uh, conversions. Uh, but in, can we go further? In the end, what Misra recommends in, the, uh, in its preamble, because that's something you cannot check, is actually strong types. And that is, you, the C++ type system, to create your own application-specific types that model your application domain. And it can be as easy, even if you program in C, as wrapping a number or a string in a struct. You still need to write the functions for the desired functionality, but it helps you to not have too many operations. If you look at string or vector, they give you a plethora of operations with the risk of undefined behavior sometimes, and also with the complexity. Uh, uh, you wouldn't want to, let's say, find a substring in a uh, hmm, substring, hmm, say. Uh, uh, in whatever, in my first name. That's usually not required when you do things with names in a, in, in a system. No casting, not casting away const or volatile, uh, that are things that the, um, so in my book, it's even stronger. Every cast means you lacked something in your type system of your application, in your type organization. Now, as many others, I also have written a framework for creating your own strong types, which tried to be the simplest possible thing that could work, which is also something I learned from Ward Cunningham, do the simplest thing that could possibly work, and it might just work. We are too eager to over-engineer as programmers, don't. Unit tests and test room development help you a lot with getting your program less over-engineered. Because a lot of situations where people try to over-engineer, they actually under-engineer. And this is just how to how you use it. There's a CPP con, you know, CPP uh, now talks taped on YouTube where you can uh, learn more about the makings of uh, uh, my pst, uh, strong typing frameworks and so on. So you can have literal suffixes and there are two different options on how to uh, implement things like a oh, liter gas is representable as a double and it has additive behavior and ordering and output behavior that mixes in the corresponding operations. And we even have some convention things. If there's a, a, a thing called suffix on output, it will be appended the blank L. And uh, this is a similar thing. And how do you do it if you don't want to if you just want to use the operation mix ins and not the other things. Another QR code. Um, there are a few things because it uses mix in by inheritance. There are things you might not want to do, like uh, having a delete, uh, putting them on the heap and, and then use delete on the base class pointer that is, uh, doesn't have a virtual member function, but that's, uh, you're holding it wrong if you try to do that. Um, and using heap explicitly is something you don't want to do anyway. Um, and those, uh, the pst is meant for wrapping simple built-in types and not kind of things where you would, uh, that are really, really big. Then do your own management. Again, if you don't get that QR code, just send me an email. Um, now, I created a lot of libraries after working on, or while working on MISRA to say, okay, what can I do to actually make it simpler to avoid violating MISRA rules, especially the integer arithmetic overflow things. So I created that strong typing library. I created uh, my, my uh, strong uh, safe integer library, uh, which someone nicknamed PIS in because of the many S's, uh, which is something uh, that stuck. But I also have a, a variation of that library. The first one is not giving you undefined behavior because internally it uses only unsigned arithmetic with some additional protection uh, and not allowing to actually mix uh, signed and unsigned integers like you would be able to do in C++ anyway. And uh, the PSS Odin is for um, 
Safe overflow detecting integers is a bit more elaborative because you want to signal that you get overflow. And there's another one that is set variation at arithmetic that's not ready for prime time yet. And there's more to that, uh, just go for that. Now I'm running out of time. I just give you a little bit of more MISRA things like, oh, non-static data members should either be public or private. And that is for either encapsulation or aggregation. Encapsulation very often is overrated. If you create a struct with private members and then have getters and setters for every member, you better write it, make them public. <laughs> Just cheating. Uh, 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 it's like I've seen that in Java so often that I, and because the IDE had that, oh, make getters and setters. No, that's not object orange program. That's just breaking encapsulation that uh, shouldn't be there in the first place. There are other things on special member functions, which I'd like to point out a bug in the standard type system. If you have a class like this one, TA, that gets automatically an assignment operator, or two actually, a move assignment and a copy assignment operator. And copy assignment or assignment operators are member functions and member functions can be that are not qualified and the standard defines them to be not qualified, the compiler provided ones. And unqualified member functions for legacy reasons can be called on temporary objects. With C11, we got the distinction between temporary objects where we have, which are R values and you have R value references. We got L values with L value references we can refer to, and we got const L values, LV, const L value references that can either refer to an L value or can refer to an R value that is, let's say, um, lifetime extended when the const reference is bound to it. Now, if we look at a typical operator, assignment operator definition, actually on the left hand side you see there is this returning the class object by reference, the this object, where it is applied to. And if you look at the, reg the regular thing, it returns the this object of pot that can potentially um, R value. Returning an L value references from an R value is a, a bug because you have a a long living reference, an L value reference, to a temporary that is gone. Now, what happens if you try to assign on the left hand side a temporary, on the right hand side, whatever, you return the L value reference to that temporary here where my cursor is from that function. And that means you're returning an L value reference to something that was ephemeral. It's gone when you can actually use that uh, L value reference. And that's a bug in the language specification. To avoid that, the MISRA guidelines tell you to actually, if you define your own assignment operators, put that little ampersand here, which actually means that the this object must be an L value and not an R or an L value. That guarantees that it's only assigned on the left-hand side is always an L value. And that is something that was forgotten when C11 was standardized. Actually, it was forgotten in the time frame of what was called C++ OX. There have been papers that introduced that feature, claiming we should also change the uh, assignment operator specs, but it didn't never happen. Happen. People were so eager to get concepts in and pull them out again that they forgot these uh, uh, janitorial uh, tasks. There's more about special member functions. We've seen that yesterday that we use appropriately and appropriately is, is a wiggle way in the MISRA guidelines. Okay, there's a, a two paragraph or even two page specification what means appropriately. And there are so many cases on, on what, what you can actually do that, especially 1501 is, is the, the, the hard part. Um, it talks about copy and move operations and the appropriate signatures. The most important thing, all copy operations use constref as a parameter type. The move operations must be specified no except and the assignment operators must use the L value ref qualification. What also means appropriately in 1501 is 
don't have constructors with an empty body. Who has ever seen a constructor with an empty body? Go home, delete them on Monday. Because they are completely useless. And also, they make things more complicated if you have to review the code. Code that isn't written down doesn't have to be reviewed. And for the destructor, the compiler will almost always do the right thing, unless you're in a situation where you need to do something more than just having nothing in the destructor. Um, the MISRA guidelines distinguish between three cases. We have unmovable objects, move-only objects, and copy-enabled objects. Copy-enabled objects in my book should actually have value semantics, which means not only being copyable, but also that each copy is completely independent and the value it represents is independent of all the rest of the system. If you have a thing what the MISRA guidance calls a customized destructor, a destructor with body, that means that your actual type is what I call a manager type, which means it does clean up work. And that cleanup work requires you that you care about copy and move operations, which must be specialized as well. And that is kind of the situation, actually, what when you have to write a destructor, then you care about copy and move. Just the guideline is phrased other way around. For whatever reasons, don't ask me. I cannot explain them. It's just the way how we came up with the spelling to make it sure that the um, you only care about copy and move when you have a customized destructor. But the re reasoning when you implement something usually, oh, I need a destructor, now I have to care about copy and move. So that's, that's the, the bit other way around. Now, to get your head around what to do with the type system, I introduced four categories of types, which is important. Value types have the most value. The problem is it's the thing that you can say the least about because all the language defaults in C++ just work for value types. If you combine value types in a class type, your class type still becomes a value type. Perfect. Value types you can copy around and the copies are kind of identical for the purpose of the uh, situation if it's a new object and they are completely independent of each other. For example, if you have a standard string and hand it to someone else, as a copy, that copy of the string is independent of the original. The second category is what I call relation type. And relationships are hard, not only among humans, also among objects. And relationships have the problem that you have something that points somewhere else, and that relationship, and that you don't know what that other object state is in. And that makes it a potentially dangling thing. And when you, when you access a dangling thing, it goes bang. And therefore, uh, Tony Van Eyre termed the nickname of dangs. Also, relation types are dangs. And relation types, pointers, references, but also things like views are relation types. That was Nico's talk yesterday all about views. But views are relation types. They are hard, not beginner friendly. And then the last ones are what I actually have named janitor types, cleanup, keeping things running, that are managers. Those are the class types that have a destructor that is defined with a body that is non-empty. I talked a lot about the value types, relation types, and remember views are relation types. One thing you shouldn't do with relation types, return them from a function or have local variables of relation type. And returning a view is like returning an, a reference because the view could actually refer to something that's local to a function and you wouldn't recognize. So having a string view as a return type of a function is really dangerous. It might work, but it requires the superhero abilities to keep track of which memory region a string view actually refers to. And remember, unique pointer is not, a, is not a, a relation type, even though it has PTR in its name. It's a manager. 
There's polymorphic types. Just quickly, if you have a base class that is, has virtual member functions, you must make the, uh, the structure virtual. And it's rare that it's also a manager type, so it's virtual and defaulted. No empty body equals default. And you must suppress copy and move. And the simplest or the least amount of code to make it is delete the move assignment operator. And there is a whole talk about that and why that's the simplest thing. Um, managers are those that have a customized destructor and I have some code on how to do that. I'm maybe one thing, if you create a unique manager, what you end up with, you have to implement transfer of ownership. And transfer of ownership, uh, again, there are people writing books that are more than 170 pages on move operations. I have a single line explaining move. To actually, that move makes sense, you have to have a type that is kind of, has, has kind of a, a, a container thing with something in it, and you can actually take that out and put it in an empty object that doesn't have it in it. And that's what's happening. If you have a move assignment with an empty object A from an object B and you use the move assignment qualifying the, the B object with move, what you end up with in the end in A you have the content that was pr previously stored in B and B is empty afterwards. <coughs> The standard tells you about, oh, a move from object is a valid but unspecified state. That's an optimization. If you implement your own manager, unique manager types, make it empty. Otherwise, it's kind of weird to argue about. At least have it defined move from state that you're actually using. General managers are those with value semantics. They are easy, again, to use, but hard to implement. And the most important thing, there you have to implement copy operations and the move operations are optional it's only a potential optimization and we heard yesterday already premature optimization is the root of many evils and again if you're eager to implement move operations in your types hold your horses just implement copy if you can now, how to learn more about Misra? Actually, there's a link in the handout. Get it for 15 uh, pounds. I should be able, let me try. To follow, to follow that link. So that's the uh, sales page. You get the PDF for 15 pounds, which is kind of a fee. Yes, but it's cheap. So it's not much more than 15 euros. Maybe it will might, might become a time when there's less than 15 euros. I hope not many too many uh, UK people are here. Um, and it gives you an impression on uh, what's in the guidelines and why does it cost money? Yeah, well, someone needs to run this website. I think that's the main reason. You can even get a print on demand from Amazon, which is around 50 euros. So. Remember, treat compiler warnings as errors, sanitize your code, value rules, use value types, create value types, make them strong types, reduce the need for relation types. Whenever you need a relation type, reference, point, or whatever, be aware you need to wear safety goggles and uh, safety gloves and a superhero cape to make it work. Use strong tapes. I didn't show error handling. That was a topic on Tuesday. Um, again, no legacy loops. Almost made it into Mizra C++ is something I uh, uh, teach. Use algorithms. And even range four is kind of pro can be problematic. Use managers consciously and encapsulate all the bad stuff that when you have to deviate. And again, I show the slides. You can ask me anything, but I ran just a little bit over time. But I, I was late today already, so I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Peter. So I hope we have some questions. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I have some contradictory opinions on the unreachable 
uh, things because, for example, when you have an, an enum, when you are in a switch, if you are forced to never have an unreachable statement, you have to add, to add a default value, even though the enum is like, okay, I have um, possible values that I'm going to handle. Actually, that, that case is treated for if you have an unscoped enumeration without an underlying type, only the enums are present. If you have a switch statement over that enum type, you don't need a default if you list all of the values. That's in the MISRA guidelines. Okay, that, that's great. <laughs> and, we thought uh, about that case. All other enums will have require a default value because you would have the all values of the underlying type as possible values of the enum. Yeah, that was the result. And a second question is, uh, the same way we have a, a mechanism to, to make a type alias in the, in the language, why don't we have a mechanism to make a type that is the same as the, another type, but they are different? like a strong, a strong alias. To... Uh, there, there have been proposals on having strong type aliases. Um, the thing is, to actually make it useful, you want to actually restrict the number of operations you can have. And the simplest way is to just have a struct with a member, because then all operations you have to define yourself. Uh, that's one reason I made my framework and others made the frameworks to get some operations automatically or let's say at user choice. I deliberately didn't make any operations available unless you asked for them. I made some reasonable groupings like a linear, a linear behaving type that you have a scalar multiplication and addition and subtraction. But there are other types so you might not want to do any kind of let's say, algebra at all, even if it's internally a number. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. More questions? I have a question. Who will get, or let's say, who will try to get access to the MISRA standard? Does it count if I already have it? Yes. <laughs> Okay, just to make sure that the website isn't crashing. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Peter. Peter will be around so uh, today a little and, bit. And most of tomorrow as well. Okay, good, thank you very much. Thank you.